That's perfect. Let me review where we left off. So uh, last time uh, I told you a story, and uh, the story uh, in sort of in summary was the following, that, uh, well, we learn from explicit examples, explicit solutions of the Einstein equations that sort of some sort of singularity happens dynamically. Okay. And we learn from Penrose's incompleteness theorem that geodesic incompleteness okay. is not going to go away uh, after perturbation. That's to say that is a stable property, so we have to take it seriously. And, well, given that realization, okay. on a second look at the sort of Oppenheimer Snyder spacetime, a spacetime when, in some sense, when it was first written down, it looked to be maybe pathological. Actually, this is as, as good as it gets because, quote, singular behavior or geodesic incompleteness, let me say it like that, is organized in a very, very nice way. And sort of the cosmic censorship conjectures, they conjecture that those good properties Okay, hold for generic initial data for reasonable Einstein mother systems. So what are those good properties? Well, the first good property is that despite geodesic incompleteness, so there may be some observers that only live for finite time, but if you're sufficiently far away, okay, you, you, you live for all time, and in your past you don't see anything which is bad. Okay, not in finite time. So uh, the sort of uh, mathematization of this statement is that uh, there is some notion of future null infinity. This is the sort of the representation of faraway observers, in fact, faraway observers in the radiation zone. And this is itself complete. So spacetime may be geodesically incomplete, but future null infinity is complete. So this is true for Oppenheimer Snyder and weak cosmic censorship is the conjecture that this is true for generic asymptotically flat initial data to reasonable Einstein matter systems. Okay. What about strong cosmic censorship? Well, this takes longer to uh, understand why this is good, but uh, nonetheless, it is widely considered to be good, and that's why we, we want to conjecture it. So let me remind you. Well, you can ask in Oppenheimer-Snyder, what happens to these incomplete uh, Observers, okay, so it so happens, first of all, related to what we just said, that they, they all have to pass into a black hole region. But moreover, uh, in finite time, they reach this, quote, singular boundary, r equals zero. And, well, okay, of course, we all know that sort of the, the curvature blows up here, which is already a good start. But actually, something far more traumatic happens to observers. They're actually torn apart by infinite tidal deformations. So why is this good? Well, it's certainly not good for the observer themselves. But for the theory, it's good in that, in a perverse way, this makes the classical theory deterministic. Okay? The observers who don't go in the black hole, they live forever. Theory predicts for them. The observers who do, again, theory predicts exactly what happens to them from the point of view of their sort of as long as they remain classical observers. Namely, they are torn apart. Okay. So in this sense, uh, general, classical general relativity can be a closed theory, no matter what the sort of, uh, what Harvey would call the, the UV physics, sort of uh, near uh, r equals zero. Okay. So this is exactly, in some sense, why uh, one likes, one would like uh, sort of that property. And uh, what is the mathematization of this? So this is what strong cosmic censorship tries to capture. Um, so as we discussed last time, it's sort of convenient to try to say this without referring to observers per se, but just referring to the behavior of the metric itself. Okay? And of course, if you also had a lot of matter there, maybe you'd want to add an analogous statement for the matter, but let me just talk about the metric. And my claim to you is that uh, the way to formulate this is that the metric is inextendable as something. Okay? And uh, one comparison I wanted to make 
is, well, the statement that the curvature blows up, okay, already tells you that the metric is inextensible, let's say, as a C2 metric, and I'll get back to this in just a second. Uh, but actually, um, the uh, sort of calculation you can do concerning such observers, uh, this is related to the fact that the metric is inextensible as a continuous metric. Now, th that actually is harder to prove than the, um, um, <laughs> than just the statement about uh, you know, some particular observers, and well, I discussed that a bit uh, last time. Uh, let me make one uh, remark that actually was, was pointed out to me by a member of the audience. Um, of course, uh, so the statement that the curvature blows up here, you can, you can capture by saying that, let's say, the metric is inextensible as a C2 metric. But actually, that in, in, in the Schwarzschild, in the pure Schwarzschild case, that's a, that's a reasonable statement to make. But in Oppenheimer-Schneider, that's sort of a, a trivial statement. Because the, the metric is not C2 in Oppenheimer Schneider, in particular on the boundary of the star. And actually, in general, this, points, this, this sort of uh, highlights an important point, which is exactly why talking about pointwise curvature blow up is basically irrelevant in discussing singularities. Because actually, uh, in, in classical physics, we r routinely allow data which is sort of weakly singular in some sense, as long as we have well-posedness in that class of data. And uh, a good example, a classical example that we know and love in, um, in pure vacuum general relativity is uh, Penrose's impulsive gravitational waves, okay, where you, know, you, you allow, uh, you have in fact delta function singularities and curvature, okay, and these propagate and so this, is, this is not considered to be a singular boundary of space-time. No, these are, this is your solution. And in fact, um, it's a recent uh, series of papers by Jonathan Luke and Igor Rodnyansky where they prove that you have a well-posedness statement in that class, so in a class of initial data that includes uh, those singularities and worse. So uh, if you're going to allow those already in initial data, then certainly curvature blowing up is no the sign of sort of terminal singularity. Okay, so, um, so this sort of tells you that, uh, you know, whatever you want to write here, okay, it should be considerably stronger than, than C2, okay? And so uh, C, C0 would be, you know, the ideal, if you want, formulation of this conjecture. Uh, and it's certainly uh, suggested by, uh, by Oppenheimer Snyder. So we'll get back to this issue. You, you should think that there's a, there's a, a different version of strong cosmic censorship for whatever you, you, you want to put here. Okay? All right. Um, so there's one other uh, point that maybe I, I'll add. So, um, so b exactly because there's a lot of confusion on the, the formulation of strong cosmic censorship, which is in part historical. So th there's another property of this singular boundary which okay, is manifest from this picture, whatever this picture is supposed to mean, and we'll get back to that later on today, of course. And that is that this boundary is space-like. Okay? So the, the, the sort of the, the boundary, the boundary of space-time, which is associated to uh, incomplete geodesics, is space-like. So um, because this statement is often confused with strong cosmic censorship, let me give it a, an independent existence and, and formulate yet a third conjecture, which I'll call the, the space-like singularity conjecture. So, um, so this conjecture would say something like uh, the following. So again, for, for generic data, so let me, let me say it like this, all incomplete uh, sort of observers, so this just means whatever, time-like or null geodesics, uh, okay, 
and I'll write this in quote, meet a space-like singularity. So uh, the reason I put this in quote is that it's not actually clear how exactly you would make sort of rigorous sense of this because uh, it's difficult in general to define a priori boundaries of space-time, okay, for which, you know, this is sort of meaningful, both this and also what it means to meet, meet the singularity, okay? But at least in some vague sense, uh, you, you can imagine uh, what this means. Now... Uh, why is this? So I claim that this has some uh, connection to this. Um, and the connection, you, you can think of it as uh, follows. That, um, and we'll, we'll actually, this will become more clear later in the lecture if, if you sort of don't follow exactly what I say. But uh, there is a sense that if, if the boundary of space-time is as I've drawn it, okay, then this part of the boundary has to be singular, at least in some sense. And the reason is, if, if the boundary were not singular here, okay, then there is no reason why I could not continue space-time a little further. This still would be globally hyperbolic. Okay? So this continued space-time should have been the maximal Cauchy development. Okay? So somehow, um, you would think, provided that you could um, formulate this, okay, that this would imply some version of this, but of course not necessarily with C0 here, with something here, okay? So, okay, I, I'm not going to um, try to say more about that because, sort of spoiler alert, uh, both this statement and, and, and this statement are false, okay? So anyway, um, if, if you want, you can still uh, try to relate them. Um, okay, so... Uh, no, so... I'll, I'll, address, I'll address this immediately, in fact. Um, uh, but it, it is a good point to re-emphasize, and we'll see this uh, immediately... Uh, now, but uh, these names are traditional, and, and again, there is, a, there is a reason for the names, which maybe will be clear, but in principle, they, they are completely different types of statements, and in fact, in, in, in more PDE language, those of you who study PDE, um, then uh, you should think of this as a, as a statement of global existence, well, what's left of global existence after the singularity or the incompleteness theorem. All right? Whereas you, you, can, you can think of this statement as a statement of global uniqueness. Okay? So that's really... Okay? So this is the statement that some observers, they, they, they live forever, and okay, they don't see anything bad in finite time. Uh, this is the statement that th there's only one sort of space-time that can possibly be associated to initial data. And again, morally, at least if, if, if this is true, then sort of uh, you know, classical physics really ends locally at its boundary. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. But I think it's, it's very important already before uh, the sort of, before today's lecture begins, I warned you, the beginning of last time that I will fall behind schedule. So today's lecture has not begun yet. We are still in yesterday's lecture. Uh, so uh, before talking, you know, about spherically symmetric space times in more detail, where, where we can really make, make sense of these diagrams, and I think it's a very nice introduction to them, uh, let me uh, already tell you uh, in what ways, how, how could these properties fail, what are different ways in which these properties could have failed, uh, uh, so that you get some feeling for, for, for what these statements are meaning. So let me begin with the, the sort of uh, the first um, and maybe most well-known possible failure. So you could imagine that you have great initial data, you know, asymptotically flat with one end. Okay, I don't, again, I'm uh, purposely looking at Oppenheimer-Snyder 
as opposed to two-ended Schwarzschild and Kerr and Reisner and Nordstrom. They will, those solutions, I'll refer to them later, just so that you don't think that this is, this is about two-ended. This is about real you know, astrophysical gravitational collapse in principle. Okay? So uh, you begin with great uh, data like that. So there's a little bit of null infinity coming in like this. The evolution is proceeding all fine. And suddenly, there's some sort of singular behavior at some point, whatever that means. Okay? And well, since there's some singular behavior, Cauchy evolution at, at best could live up to such a null cone. So suppose that's exactly what happens. Okay? So suppose this is the, um, the Penrose diagram of your Cauchy development of, of initial data. Okay? Um, and suppose that uh, sort of this null cone okay, has the following two properties. So first of all, uh, you know, outside of this point, okay, this is completely smooth. Okay? You can certainly imagine this. This happens actually in all sorts of nonlinear field theories. You have a first singularity, okay? but you know, up to its future null cone, the solution is up to and including, it's completely smooth. And moreover, you can imagine that this night light cone goes all the way to future null infinity in finite time as measured at future null infinity. So in finite, what you, you should call bondy time. Okay? So finite bondy time. Okay. So this the boundary cutting future null infinity at finite bondy time is exactly uh, the statement that future null infinity is not complete. Okay? In the middle of sort of the LIGO run, they're all excited, they're going to announce some new discovery, and all of a sudden, uh, well, the, that's the end of the Cauchy development, okay? because all of a sudden, okay, you are receiving uh, signals from very near here, and, okay, well, once, once you're here, one doesn't know how to evolve, okay? So, um, so first of all, uh, this, as I've just explained, okay, means that uh, weak cosmic censorship is false, or, I, okay, I, I, I am applying the usual uh, misuse of language, which is fine as long as, namely, I, Okay, weak cosmic censorship is the statement that for generic initial data, something holds. So when I say weak cosmic censorship is false, I'm just saying that the, the predicate of that statement is, is false for this, for such an example. Okay, so I, I will use that uh, abuse of language because it's, it's obviously convenient. So weak cosmic censorship is false on account of this. Okay, but so is strong cosmic censorship. And any, any version of strong cosmic censorship is false, okay? Because, well, bec I, I told you that the metric is smooth up, up until this um, uh, sort of null cone. So, okay, I can just uh, extend space-time here. And in fact, you know, I can uh, extend space-time solving whatever equations of motion I think I was solving over here, okay? But moreover, I can extend space-time in an infinity of different ways. And that's why we want strong cosmic censorship to be true, because you know, I have non-uniqueness. Okay. So, um, so this is, if you want, the, the classic picture of a, of a so-called naked singularity. Okay, and you, you really should think that this, uh, this classic uh, picture uh, violates uh, both uh, weak and sort of any version of, of strong cosmic censorship. But you could also certainly imagine um, uh, the following picture. So again, you sort of start from your great initial data, regular, nothing wrong with it, okay? Um, here's null infinity. Bondy time is running over there. All of a sudden, there's a there's a sort of first singularity, okay? Um, but now if you look at the sort of the future null cone from that sort of singularity, that's also singular, okay? 
But you can imagine that, moreover, it still cuts off null infinity at uh, uh, finite bondy time. Okay. So, uh, so in such an example, okay, uh, well, weak, weak cosmic censorship would be false, okay. But depending on how singular this is, your your favorite version of strong cosmic censorship uh, would be true. Okay. So, uh, so they they, they they really are saying different things. Okay. All right, so that's, that's sort of uh, important to keep in mind, that in principle, these are really um, uh, different uh, statements. So let me give you another uh, uh, Penrose diagram to sort of uh, uh, ponder. So again, here's the data. Data is perfectly regular. Um, null infinity bondy time is sort of uh, running along. So you can imagine that, okay, again, you, you hit the sort of first singularity, but uh, you, you can uh, imagine the following, that um, the, this first singularity is already behind an event horizon, okay? And future null infinity is complete. So, no problem for weak cosmic censorship. But you could imagine that coming out of this first singularity, there is a, there is a, a, a light cone. Okay? And you can imagine that the solution is completely smooth on the boundary of this light cone. Okay? And then maybe, okay, maybe there is some, um, I don't know, r equals zero like singularity here. Maybe, let's picture this. Let me write this. But the metric here is smooth. So, um, right, maybe I should say also, uh, <laughs> sort of funny, since I mentioned the space-like singularity conjecture, uh, the, 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 this is uh, the, uh, the space-like singularity conjecture is false here. Uh, uh, here, uh, strong cosmic censorship is true, but the, the space-like singularity conjecture is false. Okay, um, and now let's 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 think here. So weak cosmic censorship is true now. Okay, but but strong cosmic censorship is is false. I can I can extend. Okay, so any version, if this is smooth, any version is false. Okay. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the space-like singularity conjecture is also false, okay? Because, okay, maybe this part of the boundary is, is space-like, but, uh, but I have this part of the boundary that's not space-like, okay? Um, so, uh, so it turns out that there's something, uh, there's something else that can happen. Um, so if you want, this, is, this example is already a, a, a reason why historically in, in, in saying weak versus strong, historically people had this in mind. Okay? So this is something, let's say, which is not a counterexample for weak cosmic censorship, but would be a counterexample for strong cosmic censorship. Okay? But it's not the only possibility. Um, so let me give you something more sinister that you can have. So again, uh, initial data is impeccable, um, sort of... Uh, um, whatever, um, this is the, if you think of this as being spherically symmetric, this is the center of symmetry. Um, well, no problem with uh, weak cosmic censorship, so whatever happens, happens inside the black hole, which is beyond the uh, uh, horizon, and uh, null infinity complete. Okay. I always have to tell you that null infinity is complete. And you can imagine that actually sort of near the center, maybe there's no problem. The sort of the singular boundary is like in oppenheimer Snyder. But maybe I have this picture. Okay? So maybe I have a, a, a sort of a null 
part of the boundary that comes out of this point here, which is smooth. So maybe this is, again, smooth. So uh, again, uh, so uh, let's just to, to say explicitly, uh, why is this boundary of space-time, why can I not, so say I can extend the space-time, why is not this part of my, what I'm calling the space-time, okay? By causality, okay? Just for the same reason that this wasn't, okay? This is not in the Cauchy development of initial data. But there's sort of a funny difference, and this is very important to uh, uh, always keep in mind, all right? In this case, you sort of know why there is this piece of the boundary. There's a first singularity, okay? And this is sort of a cone coming from a first singularity. And what's very funny about this picture is that, uh, well, it, in the Penrose diagram, it looks exactly the same. But this isn't a singular point in any sense of the word. Okay? So uh, maybe I should say explicitly, so in... in, in uh, in all of these cases, these uh, boundaries are known as Cauchy horizons. This is a Cauchy horizon. Oh, this is not a Cauchy horizon, in, at least in the class that this is singular. Okay, this is a Cauchy horizon. Okay. So it, it, it is the boundary of space-time in, in a sufficiently regular extension, okay? And the, the reason that, again, this is consistent with this being the maximal Cauchy development is these extensions fail to be globally hyperbolic. So, uh, so the point is that Cauchy horizons, they, they can sort of be generated by sort of first singular points, like we see here. But they can also uh, not be generated by, by first singular points, like here. And let me, in some sense, give you the, the most sinister example of them all. So the most sinister example is the following. So let me not even... So the most sin sinister example is perfectly regular initial data, perfectly complete future null infinity, okay? So this is complete. But the, the Cauchy development ends in a Cauchy horizon, okay? Which is entirely coming from this point, and there's no other boundary. Okay? So it, in this case, uh, sort of, if, if the metric is, is completely smooth here, okay, then you can uh, extend the metric smoothly, still satisfying the equations of motion, completely non-uniquely, so that every single incomplete observer in the original space-time passes safely to the extension. So every observer that was incomplete in the original space-time can pass to the extension. So, um, so what is this telling? So first of all, this is why one should never utter the words Penrose Singularity Theorem. Okay? Because this is exactly, uh, completely in the domain of that theorem. Okay? This, is a, this is a trapped surface. Okay? This is the maximal Cauchy development of a space-time, okay, you know, satisfying. This is the quintessential thing that you would apply Penrose's uh, incompleteness theorem to, and Penrose's incompleteness theorem successfully tells you that it is geodesically incomplete, okay? But it is not geodesically incomplete because any observer is encountering a singularity. It's geodesically incomplete because it can be extended, and it can be extended smoothly, satisfying the equations of motion, so that all observers who were incomplete pass into the extension, okay? The problem with the extensions is just the extensions cannot be globally hyperbolic, okay? So the extensions are not uniquely determined by initial data, okay? 
So, um, so fundamentally, that, that theorem okay, is not distinguishing between any of these behaviors. And in some sense, you really should think that morally the proof is connected with this behavior and not with any of the other behaviors. So it, it really is not a singularity theorem. Okay? So um, now, uh, of course, already, and I'll talk about it later, this is not some exotic thing. This is just the, the one-ended version of the Kerr solution. Okay? So this phenomenon happens uh, in the Kerr solution and in its spherically symmetric um, sort of uh, cousin, Reisner Nordstrom. Okay, so in that case, you have two-ended uh, initial data, uh, and, and the solution looks like this. Okay, and this is a Cauchy horizon. And again, if you want, you can, you can apply Penrose's incompleteness theorem to this, and it's telling you that this is geodesically incomplete, which it is, and that's, that's true. All these geodesics are incomplete, but you can extend in an infinity of different ways, none of which is better than any other, um, such that all these incomplete observers gets, gets by. Okay, so this, uh, this is how um, uh, weak and strong cosmic censorship can, can fail. Okay? So the, the conjectures are trying to say okay, <laughs> that all, all those things do not happen generically. Now, uh, one thing should be clear uh, immediately uh, is that uh, you do need the caveat uh, generic, and maybe I should say this uh, uh, very explicitly at, 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 at the beginning. You certainly need this. Um, this was clear from the very beginning for strong cosmic censorship slash space-like singularity conjecture, because of course uh, the Kerr solution was known. Okay. Be, beforehand, and okay, if you're willing to allow two-ended data, or if you put something in here, which you can do to create something like this, then, well, it, this is a counterexample. Okay. So immediately, <laughs> you know, the best uh, you could hope for was, was generic. Uh, when weak cosmic censorship was originally conjectured, uh, it, it wasn't clear that you needed uh, genericity. Uh, but uh, it turns out, and this, this is something I'll, I'll, I'll um, talk about uh, later, it turns out that, that you do. Now, maybe I should say, though, very clearly uh, already one important thing. Uh, so, always when I say initial data, this initial data for what? You know, for, so you should think in all of these um, um, conjectures, it should always be initial data let me, let me write it because it's so important. Okay. For, for a reasonable Einstein matter system. So what, what is a reasonable Einstein matter system? So, um, so well, the vacuum equations, they should certainly be reasonable. If that's not reasonable, then nothing is reasonable. Okay? So certainly these conjectures should hold for vacuum. They should hold for electrovacuum. Um, but once you start coupling with mother, you might have problems. So um, one of the big ironies, actually, of, of Oppenheimer-Snyder is the following. So remember, Oppenheimer-Snyder uh, was um, uh, a solution of the Einstein dust system. So Einstein perfect fluid, where the perfect fluid is uh, pressureless. Okay? So, um, so, of course, this played a very important role uh, in uh, uh, sort of the elucidation of the notion of, of black hole and in our picture of gravitational collapse. Um, and if you remember, uh, uh, what was true about initial data for uh, for uh, the Einstein, for Oppenheimer Schneider. Uh, so the, the density initially was constant. Okay, so it was constant inside what we think of as the star, 
and vanishes outside. Okay, this was this was the model. Um, so it, it it turns out that within spherical symmetry, actually, if you perturb a little bit the initial state, keeping spherical symmetry but uh, not having constant density, uh, you you immediately get something like this, generically. And uh, if you perturb a lot, you actually get this. So, um, so at least within spherical symmetry, weak cosmic censorship is actually false for this model. Okay, and strong cosmic censorship. So everything is false for this model. But, um, but that, it's not, um, it, it is not correct to interpret that as a failure of sort of the spirit of these conjectures because uh, somehow this mother model, okay, is a very sort of uh, special type of mother model because it does not take into account pressure, okay? You can think of this as an idealization of a perfect fluid with a reasonable equation of state, okay? And, uh, and actually, uh, sort of what happens in, in this case is that the, the, the density blows up here. And when the density blows up, you might think that, okay, pressure is actually important. So even if your equation of state was such that, okay, you're, you're sort of, you're ignoring pressure and you're modeling by dust, when you get near here, pressure is important. So, uh, so in any case, uh, what, what this is sort of telling you is that mother models that sort of on their own give rise to sort of very singular behavior, okay, are not good mother models to try to address these questions in, okay? And so, you know, even some of the, you know, most uh, famous mother models in sort of the story of gravitational collapse are actually very pathological in reality and, you know, are not, you know, in the class of reasonable Einstein mother models, okay? So this is something uh, to, to, to keep in mind. Uh, sort of a, what, what you should think of as sort of a safe mother model, a mother model that you certainly would want this, uh, these conjectures to apply to, is a mother model where the equations of motions themselves are linear. Okay, that, that should certainly be safe, okay? Because those linear equations do not form singularities of their own accord, okay? So uh, Einstein's scalar field is one such example, Einstein-Maxwell. Uh, another nice uh, example of that type is Einstein uh, Vlasov. So Einstein coupled to collisionless Boltzmann, and all these sort of are nice models. They even have sort of some um, uh, sort of uh, physical interpretation in, well, in some sense in uh, realistic uh, problems. Uh, but uh, conceptually, they're sort of uh, very useful mother models to keep in mind. All right. Um, in, in particular, uh, one, one should remember, if one wants to consider these problems restricted to some symmetry class, for instance, to spherical symmetry, you have to add in matter by Birkhoff's theorem. Okay? So sort of uh, very often in the context of the study of these problems in, in spherical symmetry, okay, the choice of the mother is not because we believe in that particular mother model, but it is, you can think of it as a sort of a model problem, okay, to understand even the vacuum case without symmetry. And if that's how you're thinking of your mother, then you certainly don't want the mother to have pathologies of its own, which are very different from the vacuum. Okay? And that's sort of what actually happens uh, with, with the failure of these statements for Einstein dust. Okay. All right, so, uh, with all that said, uh, let's begin uh, lecture two. <laughs> so lecture two is basically, I want to make sense of what, what these pictures mean, and then uh, lecture three, I'll tell you what sort of what we know in spherical symmetry, and lecture four, well, I'm very optimistic. Uh, what, what, what we know definitively uh, not in symmetry. Okay. So, um, all 
All right. So, so the, the title of this uh, lecture two is uh, Spherically Symmetric Dynamical space times. And Penrose diagrams. Okay. And this is a, as I said, it's a great world for understanding all sorts of issues connected to gravity. There's so much of, I mean, everything that we drew can be understood in this world. Okay. So, um, so first of all, note the word dynamical. Okay. I will always think of space-time as being the Cauchy evolution of initial data because that's sort of general relativity as a theory. After all, is that it's the thing that <laughs> associates, you know, this. Unique solution to the initial value problem. Okay, so, um, and moreover, I'll, I'll, I'll always be living in the asymptotically flat world. Although, as we sort of discussed last time, and we saw in the last lecture of Toby, uh, it is also of interest to consider other asymptotics, like asymptotically ADS, uh, sort of, Space time, then, of course, it's no longer a pure initial value problem. It's an initial boundary value problem. Um, but you can, you can certainly uh, discuss that world in much the same language that uh, I will talk about. Okay? But I will only look at the asymptotically flat case. So uh, I first have to tell you what asymptotically flat, spherically symmetric initial data look like, okay? So, um, so uh, initial data, so this is a, um, um, a three manifold, and if you want the, 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 the manifold uh, topologically, okay, uh, can either be R3 or S2 cross R. Those are the only two cases, okay? This is the so-called one-ended case, and this is the, the so-called two-ended case. Okay? And uh, I can write the metric. This is the initial metric. This is initial data. Okay? I can write the metric if you want. I can think of... Uh, uh, so, it's sort of funny. Uh, R3, you can think of it again as the sort of warped product of uh, S2 cross zero infinity, okay? So I don't know how to write that. Okay, so some warped, warped product, okay? Um, and uh, ah, I've already written it backwards, so let me write R first, okay? So I'm going to write, write the metric uh, like this. Um, so normally you might think that the, the coordinate here should be called R, but I'm going to call it X. Okay. So X. And you'll see exactly. So I'm going to write the, uh, the initial data metric is some, some function H uh, of X dx squared, okay, plus, um, and this is why I wrote this as X, because I want this to be R, okay. Uh, and here I'm going to write the standard uh, spherical metric, right? So, um, so what you should think is that in, in, in the one-ended case, okay, this is the one-ended case, okay? Um, so when you write the metric like this, you see what this R means geometrically, uh, R is the sort of well, modulo factors of four pi. It is the, 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 the area, okay, of these spheres. So I want R to be the area of those spheres, okay? So um, it could be, in this case here, that I can also use R as a coordinate, okay? But I might not be able to, okay? Because um, uh, 
no one is telling you that R should be monotonic. Okay? And in fact, in the two-ended case, okay, R cannot be monotonic, so it's clear that I, 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 could, n I could never use R as a coordinate globally on initial data, because, of course, R goes to infinity here, and R goes to infinity there. Okay. So here, R is equal to zero, and R goes to infinity. R could be monotonic, but it might not be. Okay. Generally, it won't be. OK. So, so that, that is one part of initial data. Of course, uh, I also need uh, to prescribe the second fundamental form. Okay, And well, in general, in, in spherical symmetry, you, you better be solving an einstein mather system, because otherwise, the only solution is, is Schwarzschild. Okay? So there will be a bunch of fields which will also need their initial data, but I'm, I'm not going to refer to them at this point. I'm not going to specify the sort of mother model. I'm going to make general statements about the geometry. Okay. All right. So, um, uh, so what I'm going to suppose is simply that whatever the mother fields are, okay, they they, they do. Uh, determine a well-posed, so this is the notion that Harvey talked about in the morning, a, a, a well-posed uh, system of equations. So just like for the pure vacuum, we can talk about uh, maximal Cauchy development, which will be a globally hyperbolic space-time, satisfying the equations of motion and admitting this as data. Okay, so um, let me write that. So um, I'll um, suppose m comma g comma bunch of mother fields, okay, is a globally hyperbolic space time. arising from uh, initial data uh, from sort of spherically symmetric initial data. So initial data of uh, type, I don't know, one or two. Okay. Let's call this type one. Let's call this type two. So, um, so I want to draw a picture of, of M or some representation of M. So here is my claim. Um, uh, and this will explain the mystery of uh, these, uh, diagrams. So, um, so point one, uh, is um, then M is spherically symmetrical so geometrically that means that SO3 acts by isometry note this is a this is a <laughs> consequence I, I uh, let me emphasize this fact this follows from well posedness if you want uh, if your initial data uh, or have some continuous symmetry, okay, then the solution, the Cauchy development of initial data will inherit that symmetry. This is a corollary, you can think of it as a corollary of uniqueness. Okay, so that's a good exercise. All right, so remember, assumptions can only be made at the level of initial data. Yes? Well, covering the whole thing is not the same as being a coordinate. It, it is a, to be a coordinate, it has to be, uh, so in, the, in, in one dimensional, so to, you know, relative to the, the actual coordinates, you, you understand some 
Jacobian has to be non-vanishing. So in one dimension, it just means that the, uh, right, so, so if, if R is a function of X, okay, uh, its derivative vanishes at some point, then that tells you that R, R is not a coordinate. Anyway, um, I mean, it could be worse even, that's to say, uh, you know, R can even be constant, you know, in, in an interval like that. There's no, you know, that's also allowed. It actually happens in uh, what's called Narii solution, it's like that. Uh, anyway, um, okay, so then M is spherically symmetric, um, and moreover, and can be covered by global double null coordinates. U and V, i.e., you can write uh, the metric globally, okay, as uh, G equals some function, which I'll call minus omega squared, of u comma v, du dv, plus some other function r squared of u comma v, times the sort of standard metric on the sphere. So if you want uh, u, v, theta, phi are global coordinates, of course, okay, global Modulo the trivial okay fact that you, okay, you, you lose a, right a great circle uh, or half of a great circle on on, on the sphere okay um, so um, so this is actually a good uh, 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 this is a very good exercise already okay this one is using something I mean first you have to infer this, that the spherical symmetry is is preserved. And then, uh, why are these uh, coordinates global? Well, this, this has to do with the fact that M is, again, by fiat, globally hyperbolic. So it is globally hyperbolic. And I've told you something about the initial data. It sort of looks like this or this. So already, this is a good exercise. But some of the things I'll say in just a little bit of time will maybe uh, throw some light on how, how you would already prove this statement. Um, so let me uh, make a, a, a trivial uh, amplification of this statement. Um, so null coordinates are manifestly non-unique, okay? In particular, I can always rescale uh, u. I can always uh, consider a, a new u tilde to be an arbitrary monotonic, in order to be a strictly monotonic uh, function of u, and, and uh, sort of... Uh, uh, also uh, uh, v. So if I have null coordinates uh, for, for any choice of, uh, of strictly monotonic you know, uh, functions, or strictly, I should say, yeah, such that f prime, let's say, without loss of generality, is, is greater than zero, and g prime is greater than zero, then I have new null coordinates. Okay? Um, so in particular, by your, your, your favorite diff diffeomorphism of uh, you know, r to you know, the interval minus 1, 1, Okay? You can always uh, assume that these coordinates are bounded. That's to say their range is bounded. Okay? So let me write this here already by bounded. Okay? So, um, so now I can think of the, the bounded null coordinates as defining a bounded map Um, so I can think of u comma v, okay, as defining a bounded map of the manifold M, okay, to R2, okay, and I want to think of R2, if you want, as R1 plus 1, okay, and I want to make the following identification, so uh, think of, uh, uh, ambient uh, coordinates uh, on uh, R1 plus 1 as T and X, okay? 
So let my identification be this. Okay. So, uh, so if if you want the 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 image of M by the above map. Okay. So I'll denote it script P. So it's a subset. It's a bounded subset of R one plus one. Okay. Uh, I, I call this the Penrose diagram of, of M, okay? So this is the Penrose diagram. It's just the, the range of a, bounded, uh, um, uh, of, of a bounded set of double null coordinates, okay? All right, uh, so the image uh, is called the, 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 the Penrose diagram. Okay, so um, were I a, 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 a mathematician, maybe I would say a Penrose diagram, uh, because of course, okay, there, there are many, there's lots of choices of double null coordinates. So this is not, as I defined it, a unique object, but it turns out that it somehow it's 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 sh everything I'm going to say about these objects sort of are are canonical. Okay, so you can uh, if you're that type of a person. You can, you can sort out that uh, on your own time. Okay, so uh, that's the Penrose diagram. So let's, uh, um, so let's um, draw. So first of all, uh, uh, I'm uh, unapologetically progressive. So uh, as a result, uh, actually, I'm only going to draw the, the future Cauchy development, okay? Because I forget about the past, I, I will look only towards the future, okay? So, um, so from now on, M comma G will be the, the future, okay? We don't look back. Okay, so, um, so what, does, what does it look like? Um, so maybe uh, I'll erase this, uh, but I won't erase that because that may be useful. So let's distinguish uh, between uh, types one and and type two, actually, uh, maybe it's better to start with type two because type two is, is actually, you have to think less about it. So, um, so in particular, the initial data itself, okay, as a, a sort of subset. So this is R2 now, thought as R1 plus one, okay? So you should think, you know, my ambient coordinates would be, you know, T, D by DT is like this, d by dx is like this, but in view of my identification, this means that d by du is like this, and d by dv is like this, okay? So, um, so I want to draw p, okay? So this is, if you want, a, what will be a past boundary of p, okay? So what, what does p look like? So here's a little exercise, okay? Whatever p is, okay, thought of as a subset of R1 plus one, it is globally hyperbolic, okay? So it's a globally hyperbolic subset of Minkowski space in one plus one dimensions, okay? So, um, so I claim that, okay. All right, I'll explain this picture in just a second, but so this is P, okay? So this is a globally hyperbolic So this is the two-ended case. So this is type two, if you want. Globally hyperbolic um, as a subset of R1 plus one, okay? Uh, and I'll, I'll explain um, 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 somehow what, uh, well, maybe I'll say uh, immediately what, what that means. That means that this P, okay, you can write it as a union Okay, of uh, closed um, uh, uh, past null cones. Okay, intersect the, the the future of this as a subset of again this ambient Minkowski space. So it, it is it is a union of closed past cones. 
So in particular, this is telling you that um, uh, given any point in P, okay, if you follow this direction backwards, okay, you will, you will reach initial data. And if you follow this direction backwards, you will reach initial data. Okay? All right. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll come back to sort of the, okay, what the, the implications this has sort of for the boundary of this, et cetera, in just a second. Let me immediately, um, so let me just, so that this picture gets some content, okay? So, um, so with this way of writing the metric, of course, this R uh, restricted to initial data co coincides with this R, okay? So actually, again, by choosing the null coordinates, if you want, you can make this exactly horizontal. Okay? So that's another exercise. So what about type 1? So remember, in type 1, okay, which you really should think is the physical case, okay, in, you know, in, in, in the real world, maybe not in some speculations in high energy physics, but in sort of astrophysics, certainly, you know, we, we you know, the, the initial sort of, the initial data does not have two asymptotically flat ends, it has one. Okay. So, um, so, um, so somehow in, 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 in the one-ended case, uh, this, this P has a, a piece of boundary that is coming up from here, on which R equals zero. Okay? So these are actually points of the space-time. Okay? Um, and what, 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 what does this correspond to? Well, again, if you're thinking geometrically, uh, spherical symmetry means I have this SO3 action acting by isometry on the manifold. And um, uh, the points here are actually points upstairs. Okay? They are not spheres. They are points. Okay? So they are the fixed, fixed points of the, the action. Okay. Um, so it turns out that the, the set of such points upstairs is actually a time-like geodesic. Okay? So, so you get this sort of boundary, and you should think this boundary is part of the space-time. Okay? And we already saw this in, in the case of Oppenheimer-Snyder. Okay? We saw this already. Okay. So um, in view of this, note that okay, so, so, so P then looks like something a priori it could look like this. Okay, of course, this is, cannot be globally hyperbolic because, well, here, here is a uh, sort of inextendable uh, null curve that never gets to sort of initial data, okay? So the statement is that if, if you take all points in P, okay, if you follow null curves in this direction, you'll hit either R equals zero, this, so this, um, I'll, I'll denote this sort of part of the boundary by capital gamma, okay? So you'll either hit uh, gamma or you'll hit, uh, so let's call this sigma, okay? So sigma is the uh, initial data, the, the initial manifold, okay? So I'll use sigma both for, maybe this is already abusive notation for, for this and for its projection, okay? Um, so, uh, so the property is if I go this direction, I either hit gamma or, or uh, sigma, and if I go this direction, I always hit sigma, okay? So, uh, so everything we did so far just follows from the fact that uh, these are uh, uh, spherically symmetric, uh, globally hyperbolic space times which admit the initial data of that form, okay? That's, Everything so far, has, we have just used that. And everything, in some sense, is completely elementary. Okay? So, um, so, so this is uh, uh, what a Penrose diagram is in, in spherical symmetry. Okay? It's something very concrete and specific. Now, what, what is it good for? So uh, let many of you sort of know, and in some sense we've already obliquely referred to, to why, but I, I should sort of spell it out. So it's good for, for two reasons. One, we, we can uh, immediately uh, infer certain causal relations in P. So in particular, if this is uh, sort of a point here, of course a point is a sphere 
upstairs, unless it's here, in which case it's really a point. Okay? Then I can look at the, the future of this point in one plus one dimensional Minkowski space. That's this region here. Okay? And the claim is, again, this is an exercise in just Lorentzian geometry, given the form of the metric, that uh, this sort of UV coordinate range corresponds exactly to the future of this sphere in this metric. Okay? So I can, I can immediately see the future uh, and similarly the, the, the past of spheres. Okay? And of course, the, the, the future of any point, actual point in the space-time that lives on this sphere is contained in the future of the sphere. Right? So somehow uh, I, can, I can see immediately uh, that sort of, you know, if I have a, a point, an actual point here and a point here, that, you know, the, the past of this point is, is contained in the past of this sphere, the future of, you know, a point projecting to that is contained in the, in, in the future of this sphere. So these don't intersect, so I, I, I know something about causality upstairs, okay? Now, be careful, you can't read off everything, so you don't know exactly, you know, if I take the, 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 the future of point on this sphere, okay, and then I reproject it to, to this picture, okay, I don't know exactly what it looks like, okay, maybe it looks sort of like, like this, okay, but I know it's contained in here. Okay. So, okay. with that caveat, you know, you, you can say lots of non-trivial things about the, the, the causal structure, but the story gets better because you now have a boundary. Okay. You have a boundary trivially, simply because this is sitting as a, as a bounded subset of um, R1 plus 1. So you have the boundary of P in the ambient R1 plus 1. Okay? And of course, the boundary, okay, let's maybe first say the two-ended case. Okay, because I'm progressive, okay, my initial data is part of the boundary, but I also have this. Okay? And moreover, because this is all sitting in R1 plus 1, I can apply causal relations using points at the boundary. Okay? So I can look at this point at the boundary and say, oh, what is the past of this point intersect P? Okay? And I get something. So anyway, uh, that's why Penrose diagrams are so uh, useful. You get for free this boundary. Now, let me be completely explicit about a very important point before I talk more about the boundary of P. The boundary of P is really a boundary of P. It is not a boundary of space-time. I am only going to be discussing the boundary of the Penrose diagram. Okay? Now, you might try to use that boundary to define some boundary of space-time upstairs. Okay? But that, in general, is uh, non-trivial. Okay? Um, this boundary is completely trivial. It's, it's really completely trivial. But that, you should think of it as a good thing. Okay? That means that we're not making any choices. We're not, this is really a completely canonical thing. Okay. But remember, this is a boundary downstairs and downstairs only. Okay? And you have to, have to remember that. All right. So what, what does this boundary look like in general? What can we say about the boundary? of P. And again, it's easiest to first look at case two. So, Okay, so let me, okay, do case two first, okay. And uh, I, I claim that, uh, so everything I'm, I'm saying is elementary causality of uh, one plus one dimensional Minkowski space, okay. I am just using the fact that P, whatever it is, is globally hyperbolic as a subset of one plus one dimensional Minkowski space with this as a Cauchy hypersurface. So I'm using nothing else. Okay. 
So what can the boundary look like? Okay. Well, of course, okay, this is part of the boundary, the initial, um, the initial data itself, okay, with these sort of two endpoints of initial data, which correspond to the asymptotically flat ends. This is the two-ended case. So one thing you might have is um, boundary components that come out of the initial data like this, okay? Because obviously, if you had any points here, this could not be a Cauchy hypersurface, right? So you could have boundary components like this. Mind you, you might not have that. So these could be empty. Okay, so you could have these. Um, now, of course, uh, these might actually uh, close off the whole space-time. That's one possibility. Um, so if they don't, uh, then you have to have at least one first singularity. So what I'll call a first singularity, so first singularity, First does not mean there's only one, by the way. It's just, you'll see what first singularity means. So first singularity means it's a point on the boundary, okay? Such that if I erect this characteristic rectangle in, in one plus one dimensional Minkowski space, the whole rectangle is in space time, is in P, except for this point, okay? All right, so note, if, if these close up, then there's no first singularity, okay? All points on the boundary, you know, part of the, you know, this part of the rectangle would not be in the space time, right? If, if I take this point here and erect that rectangle, right, this whole edge is not in the space time, okay? So, uh, so I, I know if, 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 if these don't close up that uh, I have at least one first singularity, okay? Maybe I have several, okay? Maybe the whole boundary is first singularities, okay? But maybe coming from first singularity, I have two null pieces, okay? So it turns out that uh, uh, what you should think is uh, uh, the, 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 the boundary, okay? So the boundary uh, looks as follows, okay? It's uh, this, possibly empty, union this, possibly empty, okay? Union some number of first singularities, possibly uncountable, possibly a continuum, okay? But possibly to each first singularity, there is one or two null components that emanate from it, okay? Now, again, by the way, singularity, don't read anything into it, okay? Although, you know, if this is a true Cauchy development, there will have to be something singular about such points. But at this, you know, what I've said is just using uh, global hyperbolicity, nothing else. Okay. So uh, let me uh, give you a, an example immediately, or two examples uh, that we know and love. Okay. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So example. So, uh, so Schwarzschild, okay. Uh, well, maybe I'll say Reiser Nordstrom first because it's sort of simpler. So Reiser Nordstrom, from the point of view of what I've just said, okay, the boundary looks like this. Okay, that is Reiser Nordstrom. Okay, so it's really the case that you have no first singularities. Okay, um, Schwarzschild. Okay, you have this, okay? And then uh, everything else, okay, is, is a first singularity. So everything else, all the other points, are first singularities. So if you draw the characteristic rectangle here, okay, then uh, the, the rectangle is completely within the space time, except for those points. All right, but you could imagine uh, a priori, okay, 
a very complicated situation where maybe there's some um, fractal set of uh, first singularities, okay, which some of which have you know these null components, but you know there's it's really a fractal set or something like that. Okay, that's completely uh, within the realm of possibility. Okay, all right. Um, so let me very quickly tell you um, how is this modified in um, in case one. Okay. So in case one, of course, uh, you have um, also this boundary, gamma, okay, which is secretly it's 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 not a boundary upstairs of space time. It's a, it's the fixed points of the SO3 action. Okay. So um, so of course. Um, uh, so what could happen? Well, again, of course, in, in general, you might have a, 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 a null piece that comes from here, uh, and actually, this null piece could could you know meet this boundary. Okay, so let me write that there. Uh, so does that ever happen? Minkowski space. Okay, so that's that's not so exotic, after all. Okay, so that could happen, um, but um, in general, okay, there could be a, a null piece coming from here, okay, and then everything else is either a first singularity or a null piece coming from a first singularity. Okay, so everything else is a null piece, or is a first singularity or a null piece coming from first singularities. Okay, so I, I so Oppenheimer Snyder, if you want, right, looks like this. Okay, so all these were first singularities. Okay, and this was the the null piece. Okay, but I also drew some examples earlier today where uh, where, where this was a where this was a null piece. Okay, so um, so let me just. Uh, make uh, in the last two minutes. Um, it's not so bad. We're well into lecture two, so I think it will be fine. And, but let me, let me uh, you know, make some... Uh, so Toby liked uh, to have some philosophical comments or ideological comments, so let me make sort of uh, some ideological comments. Um, in, in view of the fact that, that, that Schwarzschild and, and Reiser Nordstrom are uh, on the board, okay? Um, so, in textbooks, one reads that, you know, this picture here, okay, maybe also with a, with a past, but okay, as I said, I am progressive. Uh, this picture here is maximally extended Schwarzschild. It's the maximal analytic extension of Schwarzschild. As if the procedure of sort of coming up with space times was having space time in some patch and analytically extending the metric, okay? That's not uh, sort of how space times arise. Space times arise by solving the initial value problem. Space times arise dynamically. So the reason that this deserves to be called Schwarzschild is if you want complete initial data, which are spherically symmetric, then you have to draw this. And then this object is the maximal Cauchy development, okay? So, Schwarzschild, the sort of Kruskal extension of Schwarzschild, which actually appears in a much earlier paper of Singh. Anyway, that object, you should think of it not as maximally an analytically extended something or other. It is the maximal Cauchy development of complete spherically symmetric initial data. So th that's it. We agree on what the object is, but you should think about it in those terms. Okay. What about Reiser, Nordstrom, and Kerr? Well, it's the same, okay? At the end of the day, what deserves to be called the Reiser-Nordstrom metric or the Kerr metric is the maximal Cauchy development of Reiser-Nordstrom or Kerr initial data. And uh, as, and I'll interpret all these things later on, but as I drew informally earlier, so I can restore them now, okay? We know that I can further decompose this boundary in, in this sense, and this part of the boundary is a Cauchy horizon, and you can extend beyond. And, okay, well, in, in textbooks, you often see a particular extension in the Kerr, in the Reiser-Nordstrom case, 
that has singularities, that has whatever, blah, blah, blah. but there is nothing unique about that extension from the point of view of the Cauchy problem. Okay? Um, in particular, one, one thing that one often uh, sees is in, in a particular extension, you have some so-called time-like singularities here, and people often think that, oh, this is the Cauchy horizon of a time-like singularity, just like, you know, if you thought of asymptotically flat gravitational collapse with one end, and sometimes in antediluvian literature you see a time-like singularity here, and this is a Cauchy horizon of this sort of time. This is fantasy. You can, you can never talk dynamically about time-like singularities be exactly because they are time-like, okay? So, um, so in any case, one, one really has to learn to talk about all these questions without ever sort of thinking, drawing any particular you know, extension here, and, and well, certainly not you know, giving any weight to any particular property of you know, extensions defined by real analyticity or something like that. This, this, that is fantasy. So, uh, so it's really the case that uh, one, one should call this, if you want, the, the reisner nordson solution or you know, the Kerr solution, and well, okay, sort of the extension of this you get from analyticity, you can, one, can, one should call it something else. I mean, it is an entertaining thing to look at, but it, it has nothing to do with, with dynamics in, in, in general relativity. All right, so we'll continue uh, next time. Thanks. Thank you.